we are quite a big number today uh, with this uh, uh, very exciting results on muon uh, muon g minus two uh, seminar, and it's a pleasure to have with us uh, one of the big experts on the theoretical side uh, on this field, uh, Massimo Passera, which is also a, a friend for me. So for me, it's really a pleasure to have him. And uh, I, I just leave the, the, the scene to the, to the chair, Andrea, who will introduce Massimo. Thank you, Massimo, for being with us. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so today we are uh, uh, really happy to have uh, Massimo Passera as a speaker in this uh, seminar series. For those of you who don't know him, uh, Massimo is a, a research scientist at INFN in Padova. Uh, he received um, his PhD from uh, New York University and then spent uh, uh, time uh, at several institutions, including the uh, University of uh, Bern in Valencia. His uh, main interest is uh, uh, the phenomenology and the precision uh, uh, tests of uh, the standard model of particle physics. And he's also a world leading expert of the physics of the mu magnetic moment. And um, uh, the motivation to have this talk today is, of course, the latest uh, result uh, on the G, uh, the mu G minus two from uh, the experiment uh, at the Fermi lab. And today, Massimo will. Uh, We'll discuss uh, um, his viewpoint uh, on the theoretical predictions and also on possible interpretation uh, with the models of new physics. Uh, I think it's uh, very timely that uh, we have uh, Massimo today because uh, he's also uh, a proponent of uh, a kind of a really important experiment uh, uh, called uh, MUONI, which uh, will provide in the future a, a very important input. Uh, <laughs> for the theoretical prediction of the standard model G minus two. So uh, I'm also very curious uh, uh, about uh, um, his talk because uh, he, th he told us that he wanted to put a question mark at the end of the title of his talk, but then he removed it. So it's really the final showdown. So I will leave the stage to Massimo. Let me just say that uh, uh, we expect to have uh, questions after the talk. So if you want to, uh, Ask a question, please uh, raise your hand uh, with, the, um, with Zoom and uh, or write it in the chat. We only take very urgent questions during the talk uh, if, uh, if needed. Otherwise, uh, we expect to have them uh, after the talk. So please, uh, Massimo, it's your time. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be giving uh, one of these uh, GGI tea breaks. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. Uh, yes, indeed, there was a question mark at the beginning because when you asked me the title, it was before the announcement that uh, the Fermilab announcement, right? And so certainly the question mark was uh, needed. Now maybe it's still needed, but <laughs> I will decide. I decided to remove it, and I will discuss and say why. So well, of course, you're all here because of the beautiful result that we that we saw two weeks ago. In fact, exactly now, right at this time on Wednesday, two weeks ago. We heard the beautiful result by, by Fermilab. Fermilab confirmed the result from, uh, from, from Bukhaven, the old result from Bukhaven from the, almost 20 years ago. And uh, let me reduce this bar here. Sorry, just one second. Here it is, I put it here. Yes, as you see here, this was the number from Brookhaven, and this is the number from Fermilab, which is in very good agreement with the, with the with they are in very good agreement. And they show this discrepancy, and let's say it right at the very beginning, this discrepancy of um, 4.2 standard deviation with the standard model prediction. Now, uh, the Brookhaven one already had a discrepancy of 3.7 sigmas. And now Tremula moved a little bit to the left towards the standard model, but it has a slightly smaller uncertainty. You see them here, right? This was the result that we had from Brookhaven with an uncertainty of 63. I always use this unit of 10 to the minus 11. So let's uh, keep in mind that this uh, 63 that we had as an uncertainty from Brookhaven and the 54 slightly smaller from uh, Fermilab. And this is only run one, okay? This is only run one, which uh, really is really only the beginning of this uh, adventure because uh, uh, Fermilab only analyzed 
uh, 6% of what they expect as their data set. But, uh, and this is the result, uh, as I said, of run one, but the run two and three are already completed. Run four is in progress and then other runs are expected afterwards. So really, this is really only the beginning of this, uh, of this story. But of course, the expectation were very high because we have been waiting for so long to see if this number from Bukeme was going to be confirmed or not by factor, and it is. So one can take the average, here it is. And the discrepancy is, as I said, 4.2 sigmas. It's also great that we have, uh, we will have another experiment. There is this proposal in Japan at J-Park and it will start at phase one with a precision comparable to the one in Brookhaven. So this is the, the stage we have. And uh, the talk will be organized like this. I will uh, essentially review the standard model prediction, focusing on the latest developments and the points which are more uh, where the largest uncertainties are, which are where there are some controversies. And then in the second part, I will discuss the connection between the mu and g minus two, and in particular the Adronic contribution, which as you will see, I will discuss uh, in detail with the running, the Adronic contribution to the running of alpha, the, the electric, uh, the electro, electromagnetic uh, carbon alpha. In the final part, I will mention briefly, as and there you said, the, the, the mu and project, which is a proposal for an experiment at CERN, which is in fact, uh, its goal is exactly that one, to determine the electronic contribution, the leading electronic contribution to the mu and G minus two in a yet new alternative, alternative way. Okay, so let's start with the, oops, with the standard model prediction. When you will see WP20, this will mean that this number is from a, a white paper it's called the white paper of the mu and g minus two theory initiative, which has been a large uh, enterprise with a large group of uh, physicists that worked for a long time trying really to produce the best prediction to compare with the upcoming result from Fermilab. This came out last summer and it is uh, here. And so everyone can have a look at it. It's a big, uh, it's a big review, but it has of course, a lot, lots of details and I will really uh, pick the numbers uh, from this review. So, Let's start by contribution by contribution, of course. I mean, uh, the QED contribution is summarized, all of it in one single slide. You see it all here. It's really a uh, uh, fantastic work that has been done. We should always consider that nowadays, a lot of discussions are on the Adronic sector and uh, you will see why in a moment, or you already know, of course. But the point is that really we can talk about all this because there have been 70 years of calculations of the, L of the, of the QED contribution. By QED, I mean leptons and photons, that's it. Okay, so starting from Schwinger in 1948, and then soon afterwards, in fact, uh, the two loop calculation that you see here, the three loop, Many people worked on that. We have heroes like Midi and Laporta who worked on that. And then the four loop, Kinoshita did amazing work. And then Stefan Laporta completed the mass independent term just in 2017. We even have the five loop contribution. Now, there are small uncertainties that you see here. These are negligible, all of them. And uh, so to give you first of all an idea how important they are, remember we have uh, to match the theoretical prediction with the experimental one, which is an uncertainty of 41, okay? 41 in 10 to the minus 11. So that's what we have to keep in mind as theories when we do a calculation. So how large is the for loop contribution? 10 times that, okay? It's 400, roughly 400, 381. So a little, little, less, than, than, uh, a little less than 10 times. So it's really huge. And this has to be well under control. And it is, it is really well under control. And this is really due to the developments also in the last few years that we can really claim that this is safe. So really this is not the place to look for, for a discrepancy between theory and experiment. It has a tiny uncertainty. Well, you see tiny uncertainties uh, in, in any of these coefficients, okay, apart from mark over two pi. These are due to the fact that you have mass ratios here, the, the left and the mass ratios, they are totally negligible. The only one that we have here, this 60 is numerical, and this induces the uncertainty that you, you see down here. This is the main, uncertainty due to the coefficients. Then there is the five loop contribution. The five loop contribution is actually small. It's about five in 10 to the minus 11. So it's not an issue right now, but it will probably not be an issue even when formula will reach its final, its final result. And we know it, so we, we know it, it's, it's five. So compared even to 16 that we will probably have in the future, this is not going to be a problem. Um, there is a little, just to 
summarize every detail, there is actually a discrepancy right now between two separate calculation of one particular contribution of this coefficient of the five loop conti contribution. It's a coefficient uh, just uh, the universe, a part of the universal term, so a part that uh, is the same for electron and muon. It's important actually for the electron, but it's not crucial for the muon. So even if there is this discrepancy between these two numbers, it's negligible. It, the difference between these two values is, as you see here, is 10 to the minus 13. So totally negligible compared to our 41 in 10 to the minus 11, completely negligible. So you take all these numbers, you plug in your value of alpha and you get the QED prediction that you see down here. Okay, you may wonder which value of alpha do I use? Because as you probably heard on Christmas, just before Christmas, a new value of alpha came out and it's actually different from the one measured earlier. These are measurements from atomic interferometry. These are measurements of the ratio H over M. And in fact, there are five more than five sigmas between these two values of alpha, but actually this is very important for the electron G minus two, and I will come back to that, but it's absolutely negligible for the new G minus two. You see here, the discrepancy between these two is of order 10 to the minus 12. So again, really very, very small. It's of the same size as this uncertainty that you see here, which is due to the fact that we do not know the six loop contribution. And you see that these coefficients are growing and we know why they are growing. I mean, the, I mean, there are effects that we do know. There is the logs of the mass of the electron of the mass of the mu one factors of pi. So based on the experience that collected over the years in these calculations, in particular in the four and the five loop contribution, it's possible to guess the size of the six loop contribution. And as you see it here, it's 10 to the minus 12. So again, it's negligible. So really QED is not the place, although it's such a large contribution, it's really perfectly under control. It's not the place to look for, uh, for a discrepancy, which is good news, of course. Now, let's go to the electric contribution, much, much smaller. You see it here. 150, 154 in 10 to the minus 11. It's important, of course, it's very important. It's comparable to the size of the discrepancy between the theory and the standard model and, and measurement. It was computed long back in the 70s and the result was is written here at one loop. You see the diagrams here. But then people already in the early 90s realized that actually, well, there is the log of the weak scale of the muon mass, and then accidentally there were also large coefficients. So actually, the two loop is much larger than what, than what you would expect. It's not alpha by pi, roughly speaking, times this, but it's bigger than that. And in fact, you see, it's a large reduction from 125 to 153.6. But again, this has been checked by very many people. Even three loop leading logs contribution have been studied. It's really not, once again, it's not the place to look for a discrepancy. This is the WP20, the work, uh, white paper value. There is a tiny uncertainty here, you see, it's negligible, it's one, 10 to the minus 11. It, its origin is mainly from this, well, it's mainly from this diagram here and here. You see, there is the hadronic contribution inside the weak diagrams. You see, there is a Z here as well as here, where it was thought it would be zero of this diagram, but as you see, this is a tiny contribution, this is a contribution that gives rise to this tiny uncertainty. So not a problem at all. The problem comes from the adronic contribution. In particular, let's talk about the leading adronic contribution, okay? This diagram that you see here, this loop diagram, so you have to compute this diagram, and here you have the vacuum polarization, the two-point function, and in particular, the adronic part of that. Now, of course, you cannot just use perturbative QCD to compute this here, the loop momenta here flowing. So at uh, perturbative QCD, of course, would not work at low energies, but the solution for this, I mean, one solution to compute this diagram was, is long known, okay? And it is, uh, we know that this function is analytic. As this function is analytic, we only need to know its imaginary part. And once you know, I mean, how can you know the imaginary part? Well, you relate it via the optical theorem to something measurable, meaning a cross section. Which cross section? Well, E plus E minus into, well, into anything that appears inside this bubble. So and into any possible hadrons. Now, this is of course easily said. Uh, the problem here is that uh, this contribution is large. You see the numbers here, we are talking about roughly 7,000 in 10 to the minus 11. And as the uncertainty is 41, the uncertainty of the, of the mu and g minus two is 41, you want to know this at better than 1%. And in fact, we do know it at better than 1%, thanks to the work of very, very many people. And uh, here I summarize, I just wrote down three of the determination that uh, of people who led the field for many years. 
And they are in good agreement, as you see. The uncertainties are, of course, much larger than the one you saw earlier. So what enters in this determination? Well, you see it here, as I said, that you need to do, you need to integrate, you need to do an integral, of this, it's called the dispersive, can you call it dispersive integral of uh, the cross section, as I said, hadronic cross section of E plus E minus into hadrons multiplied by this weight here. So you have to convolute with this function K and this function K is written here in integral form is roughly goes like one over S for large S. So it really gives a lot of weight to the low energy contribution of the adronic cross section. And this you see it depicted here. If you go from threshold up to one GV, just integrating from threshold to one GV, you get practically three fourths of the overall contribution. So large contribution really comes below one GV. As I said, there's been a lot of work here, especially in the last few, throughout 20 years or more, but in particular in the last few years, there was a lot of work to combine and try to give a merging with these different groups. And this in fact in red is the number of the work package, which took into account all the results obtained above, plus constraints from uh, the Baron group that you see written here, they added constraints from unitarity and analyticity. And the result is really, well, you see it here as an uncertainty, which is 40 in 10 to the minus 11. This 40 is, uh, has been produced has been uh, cooked up to be a conservative uncertainty, okay? It's really wants to be a conservative uncertainty. Of course, many ingredients enter into this and uh, typical questions that, raise, uh, that people have, of course, is, well, you just don't take a plus e minus into pi pi and in integrate, of course. No, that's why in fact, I have this zero here to indicate that actually the cross section has to be cleaned in a certain sense. You have to remove some contribution. You have to add radiative corrections and radiative corrections at low energy, of course, are a delicate topic. They are crucial, but their uncertainty is indeed included in this 40 that you see here. And this is a work that has been done over many years to put together this, uh, this radiative corrections that have been studied for a long, long time. Now, the, uh, the, the channels that enter here, there are very many. There are more than 30 channels entering in this low energy adonic section. Uh, this is the square root of S that you see here. And this is the, well, this is the ratio R is the ratio of the adonic section over this quantity here. You see this in yellow is the pi pi channel. This is the main contribution. You see it big, this is a log scale. Notice that this is a log scale. This in gray is the pi zero gamma contribution. And then, okay, you have a higher and higher multiplicity. You see here how many channels that appear. Uh, here on the contrary, this is a, is a, these are the results for just for the pi pi channel. So the yellow, the yellow contribution that you see down here. So of course, as you see, it's really not a joke to do this. I mean, you have to combine results from very many experiments, from actually from very many measurements from different experiments. So this has been really work running for a long time, a long, long time. It has been polished. And the final result that I gave you here is really the result of, I would say, decades of work. Now, uh, the wonderful surprise actually that we had uh, uh, some time ago, and then uh, yet again on the same day of the announcement of the Fermilab because of the publication, is the progress that uh, occurred on the lattice. There has been lots of progress on the lattice. So, I mean, the calculation of this diagram, this contribution that you see here, not using data, just straight from, uh, from, um, from first principles. For many years, there were several results, you see them here, but the results had an uncertainty which was above 1%, so not yet competitive with the one that I just showed you a moment ago. This is the one that I showed you a moment ago, obtained from the dispersive approach. The surprise, I mean, a year ago, roughly a year ago, was that the BMW collaboration managed to reach a precision below 1%. In fact, the, the published number now it has a precision of 0.8%. And the second surprise is that this number is not in, uh, in perfect agreement with this. As you see, there are some tensions between the result obtained here on the lattice and the result obtained here with the dispersive approach. In fact, uh, there is, it's almost in the middle. I mean, the difference between uh, the BMW result and the, uh, the new combined, the result of BNL and Fermilab is 1.5 sigmas. And uh, with respect to the result of the dispersive approach is about two, two and a half, depends which one with the, with the white paper is 2.2 standard deviation. So it's almost in the middle between the two. I will come back to this, although I'm not a lattice expert, so I will not be able to comment uh, much about this result. What is clearly needed here 
are improvements of this other determination in order to confirm or refute this, this uh, new result, which is really spectacularly precise. I will come back to this uh, shortly, uh, later on. Let me just mention that there are additional contribution, adonic contribution. They normally don't get much attention because they are large, they are smaller and they are well under control. You see, these are other adronic contribution at higher order. Next, next leading order, you see them here, the same diagram as before, but now there is an additional photon or an additional electron bubble here. This one, I, I just drew it here for just a clarification. This one would belong here in terms of power counting, but uh, of alpha, but this is historically already included into the leading hadronic contribution, okay? So this is essentially the emission of a pi, pi, gamma in the final state. This is part of the leading order contribution. And there is even uh, the calculation of the, the Matthias Steinhauser and his group even computed the next to next leading order vacuum polarization contribution. And actually they turn out to be large. As you see, you go from roughly order 100 to order 10. So you know, it's not a reduction that you would expect. You would expect a smaller result, but it has been computed. So we are perfectly in good standing here. And then there is the famous light by light. The light by light has the, as you know, I have the trouble life. It even changed sign in its trouble life. So now we have, uh, these are determinations that we had in the last uh, 20 years, as you can see here. And this is the white paper number. So the central value is not particularly different from the one you see above, but there is a reduction, clear reduction here in the uncertainty. So if you have not followed the field in the last, say, five years, you might not have noticed, but there was really a significant improvement here to the data-driven dispersive approach, thanks to the group uh, of Colangelo collaborators and uh, in, in, in Bern and in, and in Mainz. There is really a lot of work that went into this, uh, into this new determination. And uh, it, it is actually even being confirmed on the lattice. So you see, these are the lattice results, the RBC UKQCD result, which is uh, with a large uncertainty, but in perfect agreement. And just two weeks ago, a new result from the mind scoop, which is very precise as you see here, and it's also in agreement with that one. So while the light by light, the dronic light by light I'm saying, has been uh, for many years, has been a very problematic term and many people were arguing that perhaps the uncertainty might in the end be uh, jeopardized by the precision that one can obtain on, on, uh, from this contribution, which of course is a very difficult uh, calculation. And on the lattice, imagine this is a four point function. Well, apparently uh, this is not the case. I mean, this contribution is sufficiently under control. Of course, you don't need a particularly high precision because uh, this term is, is small. I mean, it's over the 100, so obviously much smaller than the leading atomic contribution. This is uh, alpha over pi times that. So, uh, well, alpha pi times that, uh, it's a simple way of saying it. it's uh, much more complicated than that. We even have a look at the adronic light by light contribution that next to like the order, as you see here, we have this estimate and it's actually completely negligible. It's very, very small. So really this is again, not a place to look for discrepancy. And then you can uh, just take all the, the, com the combination of Brookhaven and Fermilab compare it with the white paper value. And as I said before, you have this 4.2 signals. And of course, this is the beginning of another talk in a sense, because then uh, you have, uh, it's great because uh, I've noticed that here, I'm not talking the, not, not taking the lattice, the BMW lattice result, which I will comment a little bit afterwards. But as I said, if you take the white paper result, well, then we have 4.2 sigmas. And so really uh, this is the playground for new physics. And uh, as I said, it's really another talk. It could be, of course, uh, a new physics at the weak scale, and then it would be weakly coupled to the standard model. Or of course, it would be very high and strongly coupled, or uh, it's very popular now to go to very light new physics and feebly coupled to standard model particles. I will really not discuss this. What I, what I, the question that really uh, drove, uh, drove me for some time has really been, uh, Wonderful. We all hope this is new physics, but uh, but already ten years ago, actually, uh, together with Bill Marciano and uh, Berto Silni, we asked ourselves the question: Could it be that this discrepancy is actually due to a mistake, to a missed contribution in the adronic uh, in the adronic term? I mean, the adronic cross section that enters the dispersive evaluation. So this is the a connection that they would like to discuss. Uh, would like to discuss now. 
And the idea is actually very simple. Uh, imagine that you, some colleagues, some experimentalist uh, friend comes and tells us in the next few days that actually there was a mistake or there was a missing contribution in the Adronic cross section. Sigma here is Sigma hat, okay, it's the Adronic cross section. And tells us that actually there was some missing contribution here in the Adronic cross section. And uh, as the standard model prediction is lower than the experimental value, if you increase the standard model, if you increase the, 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 the adronic cross section, you also increase the adronic contribution and you get closer to the, to the experimental value of the mu and g minus two. So it could happen that uh, some colleagues tell us that there was a missing contribution. And thanks to this missing contribution in the adronic cross section, the discrepancy disappears, okay? Of course, this is possible. We will have a look at this a bit more in detail. But the first question one can ask is, what happens if I change this ergonical section in order to, to, to solve the, or to fix the mu and g minus two problem? Well, I will also have an increase somewhere else. Something else will change. And in fact, the ergonical section sigma had that I write here simply as sigma enters, as I said before, the leading ergonic contribution. You see it written here. And the kernel here is this function k that I mentioned earlier. But the same sigma also enters in the running of alpha, in particular in the adronic contribution to the running of alpha, if you compute it at q squared equal mz squared, this is the kernel g of s that you see here. OK, so yes, I can touch, I can lift up this cross section by a missing contribution. And then I wonder what happens. Yeah, fixing, therefore, the mu and g minus 2. But then I wonder what happens to delta alpha. Well, delta alpha will increase as well. Now, as I said, I need an increase of the cross section. So let's parameterize this cross section by this increase of the cross section by delta sigma equal epsilon, epsilon is a positive parameter, times the cross section itself. Now, of course, the increase of these two quantities will be different because they are convoluted with different functions. This function roughly goes like one over s, as I told you earlier, for large s. And this one, well, if you are at low energy, well, this is essentially a constant. You see here is S is negligible with respect to mz square if you are at low energy. So this is essentially a constant. Well, this is essentially one over S, roughly speaking. So it will be, there will be a difference in the way I impact these two objects according to where I change the cross section, at which energy I will change the cross section. So let's say that I change the cross section as square root of S of S naught here, this value here, in a certain bin with a width called delta. So what, why are we, why did we focus on this? Because uh, delta alpha at mz square is one of the key ingredients of the electric fit. So for many years, uh, we have played games uh, trying to predict the mass of the Higgs boson using the mass of the W as an input parameter and precise calculation of the mass of W or sine squared effect, uh, sine squared theta effective, the effective weak mixing angle comparing the precise to loop calculations to the measurements of the asymmetries measured at lab or at C. And uh, this is what we were getting at the time. This is the upper bound on the mass of the Higgs. You see it here, the mass upper bound on the mass of the Higgs in GV. At the time in the, when we did the, the analysis was 2008, we didn't know the mass of the Higgs, but we already had an upper bound from the electric fit, which was about 150, 160 GV at the time. You see it here. So the, as I said, this fit uses the value of delta alpha at the mass of the Z. So how much does this, uh, upper bound change if I fix the mu and g minus two by increasing the adonic cross section and therefore changing the value of delta alpha. Well, as I said, it depends. It depends where I, do, I touch the cross section, at which value of, energy, of the energy, which square root of s I do that. And therefore, this is what happens. The black line, which is the upper bound on the Higgs mass, drops from the black line that you see here to the red one that you see here. So it's a big change, as you can see which, as I said, depends very much on the position of the particular energy. These are delta-like, I mean, point-like uh, beans, or these are stretched with a particular size. The message is the same. What we knew already back then is that, OK, we didn't know the mass of the Higgs, but we already knew that the Higgs had to be higher than 114 GV because of the left lower bound. So already back then, we could conclude that, well, yes, it is possible to fix the mu and g minus 2 by some missing contribution in the adonical section. But this contribution should not be at high energy, because if they occur, say, at 2 GV, well, then you would have a conflict between the electric fit and the mass of the Higgs. 
Well, many things changed since then. In particular, we, uh, we know the Higgs bus nowadays very precisely. And uh, many other things change in particular in the predictions and measurements of uh, many of the parameters that enter in the electronic fit. Actually, at the time when we did this analysis, we really only used the, the mass of the W and all the parameters that enter the determination of sine squared theta. This is sufficient to compare with the two very precise determination of these two quantities computed at two loop, electronic two loop, to make these strong bounds. But as I said, many things change in the meanwhile. So we decided to actually a global analysis. And therefore, we use using G, G theta and all the inputs that you see here. This is what we get, in particular, with the push of Alexander Keshavarsi, who really pushed us to do this, this work. This is what we obtain now. Actually, last year. This is again the mass of the Higgs that you see here. This is the square root of s, that is where you are touching the hadronic cross section. Now we know the Higgs is this line here. The error bar is there, but you don't see it because it's, of course, negligible in this scale. So this is the Higgs known very precisely. And this is the prediction of the Higgs. The prediction of the Higgs with one sigma, this, uh, this is plus minus one sigma. And the pink band is 95% confidence level. So as you see here, Yes, you can change the cross section in order to, to fix the muon g minus two. You can increase the adonic cross section, but if you increase the adonic cross section above 0 0.7 GV, 0 0.8, roughly 0 0.7, 0 0.8 GV, then you have a discrepancy exceeding 95% confidence level with the measured value of the X. Of course, you can decide to do not at 95%, you can decide to do it at three sigma and then the band will be higher and then this statement becomes around here. It still summarizes essentially with what I write here, that is shift delta, shift delta sigma of the adonic section are certainly possible, but they conflict with electrical fit if you do them above, let's say, if they occur, let's say above one GV. Great, then uh, uh, you would just say is, well, then let's, try to change them below 1 GV. Below 1 GV, as you see, the electric fit actually doesn't have much to, to say. I mean, uh, it, it's possible. So if we actually restrict to a region below 1 GV, let's take in particular the region that we obtained from the previous slide, which is 0, 07, 0, and 08. If you take this, uh, this, uh, this region and you do a uniform shift, uniform shift of the cross section from threshold, the pi, pi zero threshold up to 0, 07 GV, then uh, look at this picture. This is where we are now. I mean, this is the three point, well, where we were actually before Fermi, about 3.7 discrepancy between the standard model and the, the new G minus two measurement, two Kevin measurement. Now, if you want to fix this, meaning by bringing it here above the BNL measurement, see, doing this to this, going from here to here, then what changes is the color that you see here in, the, in this band, the yellow orange, color. The yellow-orange color tells you by how much you have to change the cross-section. So if you move it from here to here, you have to change it by, well, you have to trust me because this is not clear enough, but it is 9%. Okay, so you have to change to match the, 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 the central value of the standard of the G-2 experiment, you have to change the cross-section by 9%. Is 9% a lot? Yes, actually 9% is a lot. And uh, this plot helps uh, understanding this. So the question now is how large are these uh, changes in the adonic cross section below one GV? Because as I said, we have, if we are above one GV, well, we have a problem with the electric field. But if we are say below one GV, how large are these uh, shifts of the adonic cross section in order to fix the mu G minus two? You see it in this plot. So this is the percentage change of the address, so epsilon multiplied by hundred, the percentage change of the adonic cross section that you have to do in order to fix the mu and g minus two. When you do a shift of the cross section from threshold up to, well, up to the value that you choose here, up to the upper energy bound that you see indicated here. Let's say that you shift it from a threshold up to one GV. Well, then you need to change the cross section by roughly 5%. 5% is a lot because comparatively, this blue line gives you the integrated precision of the of the contribution. So you see, you have to change it by 5%, but the error of the, of the Adorni contribution integrated in that region is less than 1%. So it's a big change that you have to do. And this big change, of course, becomes uh, larger and larger the more you restrict yourself to low energies, which is what the electroweak fit is telling you to do. Therefore, summarizing these two slides, the last two slides, can we uh, 
can we have a shift in the adrenal cross section? Well, if it to fix the G minus two, yes, it's possible. But if you do it above one GV, roughly one GV, then you have a conflict with the electroweak fit. So you solve the G minus two, but you have a problem with the electroweak fit. Vice versa, if you do it at low energy, below one GV, well, then the electroweak fit uh, is fine. But then there is a conflict with, with what the precision that is quoted by the plus e minus experiments. Let me comment quickly on the electron G minus two. I only have a, a couple of slides on the electron G minus two because uh, the electron G minus two has been, um, there's been changes in the last uh, few months on this. And so, and it's a very legitimate question because you think, well, now yeah, I'm touching the adonic contribution. This will screw up also the electron G minus two, which is extremely precise. Well, the situation in G minus two is complicated because uh, for a long time, uh, gelatin G minus two was not used as a test of the standard model. And in fact, it was used to provide the value of alpha on the PDG, okay? And uh, this was done matching the standard model prediction as a function of alpha and matched with the experimental measurement of the G minus two. And this is the value of alpha, for example, that you get matching the standard model prediction and the experimental, the latest experimental measurement, which was done by Jerry Gabriels and collaborators in 2008. Now, in 2018, however, this group managed to produce, uh, to measure alpha with a precision which is higher than the one determined from the electron, from, from the electron G minus two. It's an independent measurement from atomic interferometry. And Therefore, you can start thinking about doing tests now of the, of the electron G minus two, just as you do them for the muon G minus two. Well, the problem is that uh, two years later, just uh, before Christmas, uh, last, uh, last Christmas, well, uh, there was another measurement of alpha and these two measurements with a fantastic precision, look at this. I mean, this was the, the uncertainty obtained by the G minus two of the electron, very high, and it reduced by a factor of three, fantastic new measurement. Problem is that these two measurements have a discrepancy of 5.4 sigma among the two. Uh, I, have a, um, uh, I have this figure too, this shows it. This was the determination of the electron G minus two uh, obtained uh, from, uh, sorry, the determination of alpha obtained from the electron G minus two matching standard model prediction and uh, measurement. And this is the direct measurement of H over M obtained in 2018. And this is the new one obtained last December. As you see, these two really do not agree. 5.4 sigmas. Actually, there, there is, one should mention also that there is a discrepancy between this and this, which is actually the same group that did the measurement. And this is a discrepancy, but it's a much smaller discrepancy because this is a larger error. This is just two, two and a half, uh, 2.4 sigmas. So here, really, we cannot say anything because we have the, uh, these two numbers, which are completely different, and the standard model prediction, which is more or less in between. So if you want to say something, you have to take both. You cannot average these two. And you can get, out of these two determination of alpha, you can get two determination of two prediction of the standard model, which are totally dominated by the uncertainty, by the way, of alpha. You see it written here. The other uncertainty is from the QED calculation that I was telling you earlier, a much, much, uh, much smaller. Even the adronic contribution here is much smaller, which gets to our point. So you, we cannot say much about the discrepancy because, as I said, there is uh, even the sign changes, as you saw it before. With one, there are 2.5 sigma in one direction, and with the other is 1.6 sigma in the other direction. So really, the sensitivity is really only limited by the fact that we need a, a new determination or a clarification of this value of alpha, and and this is really crucial, a new measurement of the electron G minus two with a precision which is, you see, here it is. 2.8 to 10 to the minus 13, but the theoretical predi prediction have uncertainties which are much smaller. The only one which is large is delta alpha. So it's, it's really an experimental issue, something that we pointed out a few years ago with uh, Jan Judish and Pai de Paradisi, that really uh, the electron G minus two can play an important role in the study of new physics in the electronic sector, but we really need to have a, a, clear, determ a clear determination of alpha and a new determination of the electron G minus two, which is more precise. This is uh, why do I get so excited about 10 to the minus 13 here? Because if I rescale the adronic, uh, if I rescale the present discrepancy between Brookhaven 
there is no formula yet in this formula between Brookhaven and uh, the standard model prediction. And I scale it by the square of the masses, which is, we call it naive scaling, which is valid in a broad classes of theories beyond the standard model. Well, then you get the discrepancy, which is really 10 to the minus 13. So it could be an, an opportunity to see if the discrepancy that shows up in the mu one G minus two also shows up in the area one G minus two. But to do that, we need a better precision in the determination of the area one G minus two. Going back to the shifts that we were playing before on the Adronic cross section, would they play a role with the electron G minus two? No, not really. Not really because wherever you do this game at the energy you want, you have variations we are, which are of order 10 to the minus 13. And I just told you that we are not yet at the level of 10 to the minus 13. We are at level of 10 to the minus 12 or several in 10 to the minus 13. And therefore there is no impact on that. But on the other hand, we have no constraints on that either. One possible constraint that we could have is if one takes the ratio of the electron and the muon, not only contribution to the G minus two of the electron and the muon. Why this? Because there's been an interesting result last year by Justin and Simula, and they managed to compute this ratio on the lattice, reducing significantly the uncertainty. It's still not sufficiently precise because you see it's this, this blue band here and the red, this red and orange is the game that we are doing by changing the adonic section. So it's not yet precise enough to do it, but a further reduction of this blue band could perhaps allow us to test this very low energy region, close to threshold in fact, which is not at all accessible but by the electric field. But it would require an impro a, a big improvement of the, of, the, of the lattice computation of this ratio. Okay, just to close this um, section, just mentioning that uh, there have been several papers on this, uh, on this connection between the mu and G minus two and delta alpha. In particular, this one, and then the uh, very specialized analysis, very nice analysis by Gilberto Colangelo, Ferrita, and Stoffer, who focus on the pi pi contribution and coming to our same conclusions. They, they're enforcing, in fact, our conclusions. This is a very nice uh, result. Okay, I will, uh, if I have uh, 10 more minutes, is it okay? Yes, for sure. Okay. Then uh, in this last 10 minutes, I would like to talk about yet another possibility that uh, we, we thought a few years ago together with uh, Carlo Carloni Calam, uh, Graziano Venanzoni and Luca Tentadue, we thought, uh, well, we always thinking about uh, how can it be that to get this adronic contribution apart from the lattice, of course, if you really, if you use data, you have to get, uh, you have to use so many um, data sets from, um, different measurements from different, very many me measurements from different experiments. And we were thinking, but could it be that one can get one single uh, clean inclusive measurements that provides, if not all, most of the Adronic contribution? And the possibility is the following one. Have a look at this formula. This is the formula that I showed you earlier for the leading adronic contribution, leading order adronic contribution to the mu and g minus two is a dispersive, we call it like this, dispersive integral of the adronic cross section. Here it is integrated with this kernel that you see here. Now, if you switch these two integrations, if you integrate, you see first on S and then on X, you actually get this other expression here. This is actually using again the the dispersion the the, the dispersion uh, dispersive approach, but in principle you can do this integral just by using the integrating directly the angular uh, doing directly the angular angulation uh, integration using the Gegenbauer polynomials to obtain the very same formula. So the point is that if you switch these two you get another integral with this other kernel. But what appears now here is the running of alpha at a value of q square that we call the here t, which is negative. So the, the point here is that compared to this determination, which requires time-like data, it's possible to determine the adonic contribution using space-like data. This formula is not new. This formula was lo is long known. In fact, it's used by the lattice, uh, lattice trends. But uh, this was actually the formula that answered our question. Can one do this determination in an alternative way using data? And the answer is yes, you have to do scattering data, the scattering experiments. Right away, we thought about E plus E minus into E plus E minus, and 
in the T channel, but then, okay, apart from the fact that you also have the, the S channel in leading order there. And also the problem is that you cannot reach the precision that you want. And the, at available machines, we thought immediately of Bell, of course, Bell is at 10 GV, but then all the interesting physics is really in the beam pipe, so it's not uh, possible. Then we thought oh, well, at lower energy, there will be a larger opening angle. And in fact, at Chloe, the angles, which gets interesting are 30, 40 degrees, but then there are problems with the quadruple. So really, we realized that it was not, uh, uh, not feasible at the collider. But then we thought about fixed target. And this is the proposal. This is the people that proposed the, what we call the Muoni uh, experiment, the Muoni proposal for an experiment at CERN, which consists in uh, scattering muons, you see them from here, on electron in a target and studying muon electron into muon electron elastic scattering but at very high precision. So you see here, there is a target. It's a beryllium target in order to minimize the minimum the multiple scattering. These are the silicon thin, uh, thin uh, silicon strip detectors. We call this a station. And we need to repeat the station many, many times in order to have thin, um, thin uh, targets. Otherwise, the, there, will be, there will be too much multiple scattering. So we have to divide and make the many, many of these uh, thin targets and each of them followed by the strip the, the, the silicon detectors that you see here and the calorimeter at the end. Uh, the, the beautiful thing is that actually a muon beam exactly with the characteristics that we need exists, is available at CERN in the North area. It's called M2, this beam, it's very intense. And uh, so the proposal is to use this very intense muon beam, which has an energy of 150 GV, but it's tunable a bit, this energy. 160 probably will be the end. And, um, and study this very precisely, this muon electron scattering. So you understand the idea is really to study very precisely this muon electron scattering and extract from the muon electron scattering just the adronic contribution bubble that you see here. Once you extract this bubble, well, you plug it in here and you compute this integral. Now, uh, this is uh, very easy to say, but extremely difficult to do because of the extremely high precision which is needed. Let me give you an idea. Let's have a look at this integral and actually at the integrand, one minus X times delta alpha of T of X, which is, which is running from zero to one. This integral, integrand, sorry, from zero to one, this is X, is drawn here, is this red curve here. So the area under this red curve is exactly the leading adronic contribution to the muon G minus two. Now it's in the space-like region. So you see there are no resonances here. Of course, this is a smooth, uh, very smooth function. Now, would the kinematics of this beam, the M2 beam at CERN be um, good, sufficient at least to study it? Yes, actually, because uh, increasing the energy, with the energy of the beam, 150 GV, which corresponds to a square root of S of about half a GV, 400 MeV, as you see written here, you can go up in energy, up to where, up to here, up to the blue vertical line that you see here. Okay, you cannot go to infinity, to one, X equal one would be infinite energy. You cannot reach that, of course. There is therefore a region which is not accessible to the experiment, to the muon experiment, but this is not a problem because actually this region has been already computed by Justin Simola and Marinkovic and Cardoso with a precision which is sufficient for, the, for our results. So we really seem to have a, 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 a quite an ideal process because we have the energy which is sufficient to reach this uh, go above the peak that you see here. The peak is at 330 MeV uh, squared, of course, negative because this is the T channel. And, uh, and also for us, the signal is really the adronic contribution. Now, if you look at the, the, the delta alpha alone with not being convoluted, but just delta alpha alone, delta alpha alone in a log scale has this behavior here. So you see here, it is 10 to the minus three, okay, 10 to the minus four, but 10 times, 10 to the minus three, and here is 10 to the minus five. So actually, if uh, we study the shape of the differential cross section by essentially looking at the ratio of uh, signal and normalization region, we can extract delta alpha. And for us, uh, this is the region where delta alpha is negligible or to be more precise is where the uncertainty on delta alpha is negligible. Let me just give you a couple of numbers. The statistics, from a purely statistical point of view, using the beam that is already existing and uh, uh, 40, 40 layers of, of tar 40 targets, each of 15 millimeters of beryllium, in 
two or three years of running, we can reach this luminosity. With this luminosity, we estimate to be able to reach a statistical sensitivity, and please notice the statistical here, of 0.3% on the leading and only contribution to the immune G minus two. That is 20 in 10 to the minus 11, 20. This of course would be a wonderful result because uh, let me remind you, nowadays we have 40. After many, many years of work, we have 40. Here, we would have 20, but of course, this is only the statistical uh, sensitivity and the difficulty of course is in the systematic. All the systematic effects must be known at better than 10 ppm. And this of course is extremely difficult. Therefore, we did already a couple of test beams in 2017 and 18, which actually were promising. In 2019, we submitted a letter of intent to the CERN SPSC and the test run has been approved for the end of this year. In late October for three weeks, we will have the, the test run. According to the result of the test run, we will be able to see if there is hope or not for the real run, which should be in this period that you see here. Let me just one more slide mentioning that, of course, uh, this is from the experimental point of view. As I'm a theorist, of course, I'm worried of the fact that we need to know the systematic effects at 10 ppm. That means that we need to know this cross section at 10 ppm, at 10 to the minus five. And this is extremely difficult, of course. To be a bit more precise, what we need is the ratio of the standard model prediction of the cross section in the signal and normalization region, or if you want the shape, at better than. Than 10 ppm. And this has been a lot of work. So several groups have been working on that. We have the Pavia and the PSI groups who fully developed, uh, developed a fully differential fixed order Monte Carlo at next leading order, which is an important instrument to work. And our experimental colleagues are using this to simulate uh, at the moment. But certainly, we already know this will not be sufficient to reach 10 to the minus 5, of course. We will certainly need at least the next to next to leading order full. And in fact, we started working on that here in Padova and we started to study all the master integrals for the two loop uh, diagrams. And uh, in fact, the full two loop amplitude is close to completion. And uh, Pier Paolo Mastolia is coordinating this effort here in Padova. We have uh, two Monte Carlo, which uh, one from Pavia, one from the PSI, which already includes some partial sets, subsets of next to next reading order QED corrections in the edit and in the new online. We computed with Matteo Fael in the, the adonic effects, because of course, if we want to subtract, extract this adonic contribution, you, have, you should first of all compute the other, because otherwise you will mix up other contributions. And uh, that's what we did. In fact, Matteo even found a way to actually do not use time like data at all, which was a very nice result. We are using some approximation for the moment. We are keeping the electron mass to zero, so we have to reconstruct the masses, the leading logs. This, this is taking a lot of work and the PSI group is really leading this effort right now. We even studied if new physics could contaminate, in a sense, the extraction of delta alpha. We studied here in Padua with Pai de Paradisi and Antonio Maziero and the Heidelberg group did the same. Up to now, things work. We are confident that we will be able to reach the required precision. But of course, we still have some time. But of course, the results, uh, the data are not, the data are not that, uh, yet ready. So we have to still a little bit of time. And in the meanwhile, we do meetings and we do our fear initiative, which is summarized in this uh, paper that we put out last year. We meet every year, well, we, not in the last two, unfortunately, because of the COVID, but we started in Palo in 2017, then Mainz, MITP kindly hosted us, then Zurich, and now the next one will be again in MITP in Mainz in 2022. So <clears throat> let me come to the conclusions. And uh, well, the first thing, as I said, is uh, we all know this, Fermilab confirms uh, the Brookhaven result. And this is uh, fantastic uh, news. The discrepancy with the white, uh, white uh, paper of the theory initiative increases, increases to 4.2 sigmas. We have a new fantastic result from the BMW collaboration, which weakens on the contrary the discrepancy. So this result really must be confirmed or refuted by other lattice calculation. I try to answer another question. Could it be that there are some missed contributions in the Adonico section that can explain these discrepancies? And uh, well, sure, it is possible, but uh, this discrepancy should really occur at, uh, uh, if they occur in the cross section at the energy, say roughly saying, roughly speaking above one GV, then the problem is switched to the electric fit. On the other hand, if it is below one GV, there is no real problem with the electric fit, but then there is a, a conflict with the quoted experimental error 
of the Adronico section. And I will, of course, conclude just saying that, uh, well, um, Mioni uh, has a, will, will hopefully provide a completely new and independent termination, which is alternative both to the lattice and the dispersive one. So let's see what will happen. I will stop here. Thank you very much, Massimo, for the, this very nice talk. So we have already a, a few people that uh, raised their hands. Uh, so maybe we go in chronological order. We have a question from Alvaro. Please, uh, can you unmute yourself? Yes, hi. Very hi, nice hello. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to um, see you. I don't see you actually, but I hear you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm hiding. Sure. Suppose that I was for a moment an experimentalist measuring E plus E minus going to uh, hundreds. Yes. Then I would have an obvious question, which is why do you go through that amount of enormous gymnastics to change my results by 5% when all you have to do is to change the Brookhaven result by a few parts in 10 to the 11? <laughs> Well, tell this to the Fermilab friends. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the two results from Brookhaven and Fermilab in good agreement, right? So why would you change that? Well, they are the same people. Oh, but so apart from the fact that I don't know if they are the same people because 20 years passed by and the collaboration is much bigger now. So probably, yes, a fraction of the people are the same, but I doubt that this is the majority. It's probably the minority, but okay, I don't know. But still, I mean, these are two different experiments, two different collaborations. So. Well, no, I, I wouldn't go into the sociology of this, right? I have two results and as a theorist, that's what they have. No? Now, I have another question. Um, okay. It used to be said, I don't know whether, whether this is still the case, that um, the experiments on the hadronic cross-section were not agreeing with each other in a satisfactory manner. Has that changed? No, that is true. That is really true. In fact, uh, the, um, the value that, uh, let, me, let me go back to this slide. Yeah, this is a very good point, in fact. Um, let me go back here. Right, so this is an integral, of course, of everything. And the, well, the main contribution, as I said, is this one. So it's the pi pi. And in the pi pi, we have a, a range of measurements and they are not really in very good agreement. There is the Chloe result, which is integrated tends to be lower, the Babar, which tends to be higher, and then there is Novosibirsk and the Bess, other results, which more or less are in the, the well, roughly speaking, in the middle. So indeed, there are tensions between, uh, between uh, these results. On the other hand, uh, this uh, value 40 here for the uncertainty is conservative also because of, uh, of the fact that uh, this has been taken and enlarged in order to include also take into account these discrepancies. Meaning, uh, if I remember correctly, the number of the group of Michel, Davier, Herke, Manesco, and Tsang, they did an exercise by taking uh, out one set of data from, uh, the set of data from Chloe and getting one result, and then taking out the same thing, but with the bar, which are the two which are further out. Then they get two numbers, Okay, and then they take the, the, the two numbers divided by two, and that is 28, if I remember correctly, or 26 uh, times to the minus 10. So this is included in this 40 that you see here. So it's true that there are tensions, but it's also true that this number here has been enlarged in order to take into account to that. So I think that this is uh, fair to say that this number is conservative, but it's true that these discrepancies are there, yes. Oh. Okay, so we have a okay, thanks. by... Uh, Graziano Venanzoni. Ah, there. we have the uh, spokesperson of the G minus two. So he will reply to the question of Aldo now. <laughs> if you wish. I, I, okay. Uh, first of all, I have much respect of the theorist uh, opinion. So my comment is just on the people, but also on the experiment. We should keep in mind that both experiment, uh, the uncertainty are largely dominated by the statistics. So really, I mean, the, 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 only, the only element which is common to the two experts is the ring, the magnetic field. 
and the systematic error is below 100 ppb. So really, I mean, we are speaking here of a difference which is 2.8 ppm, the difference between the experiment and the standard model, according to a plus a minus. Uh, so 100 ppb is uh, almost nothing compared to that. So, I mean, and of course, people are completely different. It's not the same. Are only few handful of people of BNL are in the new collaboration. I don't know the number of people in the old collaboration, but in the new collaboration, the, the number of collaborators are more than 200. So 200, uh, et cetera. So it's, it's completely different experiment. There is nothing uh, really, Ju just the ring, but uh, the ring also is uh, shimmed to a different level. So it's, it's, it's really, really 99.9% independent. Okay, if I, I apologize. I mean, <laughs> that's what I said. If I remember, Gaziano, your number here, if one looks at the value from Fermilab, this 54, less than 20 is the systematic, if I remember well. And it is, yes, uh, for 400, I mean, our, our, our error is uh, 460 parts per billion. Right. And uh, for 460 parts per billion, of 460, 400, more than 400 is just statistical level. Mm -hmm. So the systematics 150. And just one small pieces of this systematics come from the magnetic field. And this is the only piece which is uh, uh, in common with BNL. But again, I mean, we, are, we, have, we, have, a different, we have a shimmed that the magnet is different to uniformity. So really the map that the muons experience are different. So I really don't see anything really. Uh, to be, let's say, to be really in common, really, which make, uh, which make, of course, uh, we are speaking, uh, I don't know, 4.2 sigma, whatever it is. Okay, so we can take another question from, and the, the next one is uh, Sven Heinemeyer, so please. Uh... Yeah, Massimo, thanks for this. Hi, really, hi, great uh, and very clear talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, you explained very well why you considered, let's say, unlikely that there is something in the hadronic cross-sectional shift or something like that, that could explain the data. Um, you also mentioned that there is well, some kind of cleaning that has to be done coming from the original cross-section that is then fed into the um, oh, yes. integral. If something happened in that cleaning that was not properly taken into account, could this lead to an effect on uh, G minus two of the muon, but not on the other quantities? So if I understand correctly, your question is really uh, what happens here when I go from the data to the uh, to the adonic contribution integral, I mean, to the result, to the values. Yeah. This is not just data, right? This is what you're pointing out. Yeah, you, you said this has to be clean yeah. in order to be applied. Yeah, it's true, to it's true. Well, it, it's an Contribution. Yeah, as an indication here, I put the zero. There are many things that go into this uh, work. And in fact, uh, many subtraction have to be done. All the initial state radiation has to be computed. This includes on the contrary, the final state radiation. Therefore the final state, the state radiation, as I, as I said, this contribution here is included there. This is a lot of work and certainly it has a large impact on the result. It has an important impact. It's not a detail, it's important. On the other hand, this has been studied really for, uh, I would say at least 20 years. In this, this work, this paper that you see here, this is the, as a summary of a running of a workshop that we had for many, many years in, in which many people working radiative corrections worked and put their efforts together to study exactly this. Mm -hmm. So. I, I'm certainly not saying that it's not important. It is important, but it would be surprising if there is a mistake here because of the fact that it has been studied for many, many years. But of course, it's possible. Maybe, maybe I can insert one little piece of information. I Please. had after a different talk, there was a discussion with Fred Jägerlena on this, who's yeah. also one of the experts that you quoted. Of course, he has been doing and that. If I understood him correctly, he was now questioning his own result, particularly about the uh, gamma rho mixing that mm -hmm. uh, he included into the tau data and made it more compatible with the plus or minus data. And if I understood correctly, he now tends to think that one should take it out of the plus or minus data, not add it to the tau data. And, and this yeah. may have a shift, may induce a shift or so. Or, 
Well, really the tau data is really something that was a, a very nice idea. In fact, it was a, a beautiful idea that many years ago worked very much and made people double check so many things into the plus and minus. So it worked, uh, made a wonderful work. But then it, nowadays it's really not used anymore simply because the plus and minus data became so precise. And also because you, the, the, the agreement in a sense is that you cannot have the tau prediction at the same level of, uh, with the same theoretical control that you have for the plus and minus. So you, it's hard to go to this level of precision below 1% and, and take into account the isosp, isosp breaking corrections. That's why it's not lo no longer used. Mm -hmm. So I have not spoken with Fred lately, but uh, he of course has done uh, amazing work. So. Common, but, um... Yeah. Okay. I, I would need to talk to Fred to yeah. see what yeah. he Thanks. means. Mm -hmm. We have a question then uh, from uh, Guido Martinelli. Uh, ciao Massimo. Ciao Guido. So my question uh, regards if you want uh, independently uh, of all the rest. Uh, uh, the question is how we compare BMW with the, the method from the cross-section from the data. Yes. yes. Because you, you explained to us that it's not easy to change by 5% uh, the experimental cross-section. So if I compare these two, how much I have to change one of the two in order to put them in agreement? Because uh, the difference is there. Yes. In, in other words, uh, an extra contribution, if it's uh, within the standard model, that means it's QCD or Hadron's, that uh, is certainly included uh, in the BMW calculation because that is everything. It's inclusive, sure. And so that means uh, that the experimentalist in the plus minus has missed uh, some important hadronic uh, channel, which looks uh, in, in, in a long range of energies, I mean, it's not only in one point, so which is uh, difficult to, to understand. If it's beyond the standard model, then uh, BMW should be smaller because they don't have any contribution. So I believe the real puzzle, the real point, if you want, assuming that uh, independently on the value of the experiment, uh, is how to reconcile two different uh, calculations because they should give exactly the same result within the errors. So that is a, a main problem. Then I have to say that BMW is a serious collaboration and we cannot find easily some bug in what they did. So if there is a problem, it will be very difficult to, to spot it. Okay, that was just my comment. I, I agree. And I actually have a figure to comment on your comment in a sense. And you were asking, how much do I have to change the data? Forget about the G minus two of the muon for a moment. Forget about the experiment. Now let's compare the result from E plus E minus and the result from the lattice. How much do I have to change the data from E plus E minus? So adding somewhere a cross section to match the BMW. And this is the red line. I didn't comment on this before. Uh, sorry, in fact, I should have. So the blue line is how much you have to change to fix the G minus two experiment. The red line is how much I have to change the G minus two discrepancy between BMW and E plus E minus. So uh, you see, asymptotically, if I have to change the cross section everywhere, I would need to change it by 2%, okay? And you see this number, which is half of what I would have to do to fix the G minus two experiment. The, this, what this plot shows you, however, is that uh, independently of the number of sigmas, once you go towards the left, because the electroweak fit is telling you that you should go to the left, otherwise you have a problem with the electroweak fit. Once you go to the left, this number increases and increases a lot. So if you take into account the information provided by the electroweak fit, it's not so easy to, to explain the discrepancy of the uh, between BMW and, uh, and the plus and minus data. But of course, it's much easier to explain, obviously, than the discrepancy with the experiment of the G minus two, because they are in the middle, essentially. But this plot sort of tells you that while asymptotically, this is what you have to do, once you restrict yourself towards the left, meaning to below one GV, well, you have to start changing this, this uh, the adonic cross section uh, 
more than what you would expect by integrating everywhere. Okay. Thank you. So, so this, I believe this is the real problem. Uh, yeah, this is really an they, issue. They solved, we, because that if the theory uh, absolutely, is not absolutely. solid, then uh, what we discuss. Exactly, exactly. I agree. Thank you very much. And see you soon. In, in <laughs> hopefully, yes, hopefully. Very good. Uh, so we have uh, another question from Enrico Nardi. Please, Enrico. Ciao Massimo. Ciao Enrico. Listen, if I remember correctly, the uh, increasing the vacuum polarization in the running of alpha gets in conflict, especially with the W mass and with the left-right asymmetry. So uh, which are right. already uh, in tension with the standard model. So right. uh, the effect uh, of uh, the discrepancy is some, somehow amplified by the fact that there is already a tension that becomes worse. Now, uh, do you have an idea what will happen if I yes. suppress those two, two measurements? I suppress maybe there is uh, some problem in the determination, maybe there is some new physics that uh, is affecting the W mass. So for any reason, I would like to know what happens, uh, how much can I push up uh, uh, delta adro yes. in, uh, in the electronic fields? I have a partial answer to your question because we asked ourselves a, a very similar question. In particular, let me just change slightly, but I will come back to what you're saying. What was really our concern when we did this, this analysis 10 years ago with um, Bill and Alberto was really that when we use sine square theta, we were using sine square theta extracted from the left-right symmetry at SLC and the, 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 and the forward backward symmetry from, of the B at left, right? And these two are in conflict, were in conflict and are in conflict, of course. So, I mean, taking an average of two numbers which have more than three sigmas, well, really didn't sound very well. Now, two things changed. Uh, first of all, now we have Tevaton and LHC, which have a combined uncertainty, which is better than each of these two, and it's in the middle, so which is very good. So what we can think of doing is throw away both of them, and actually we get the same result. We did an even stronger thing. We threw away all the parameters that determine sine square theta, all of them. In that case, it is determined by the W mass. And this comes to the first question that you have. And the W mass alone is stronger than that. So the result, this is the upper bound. Sorry, this one is the upper bound of the global fit, the solid black line, 95% confidence level. But if you remove all the inputs that give rise to sine square theta, so you rely only on MW, then you even make it stronger, the statement, as you were saying. And it is this difference between this and the dash dot line that you see here. But really, as you see, yeah, it's a bit stronger, but the argument is the same. You have to be below one, one and a half. But, but you keep the W mass. Yeah. Yes, that's why I said I have only a partial answer to your question because I did the opposite. I removed all the same square or parts of the same square because that's where you have the real discrepancy, not in the W mass actually. In the W mass, you have tension, I agree, you have two sequence, but is not like the forward back asymmetry and left right asymmetry where you have a pool of more than three sigmas, right? So we were worried more about that tension rather than the W1. But what you say is if, if you remove the W1, essentially you will have a bit of an enhancement here because you see the pool is exactly given by this distance. This is with the W mass and this is with the W mass and all the same square observables. This is the difference that you get. And they are both very sensitive. These are the two driving observables of the electric fit. We, we did a global fit, but what we did 10 years ago was just using NW and sense criteria and we get the same result because all the rest of the observables are not precise, sufficiently precise to compare that. So really, I think the analysis is pretty solid actually because removing things, it doesn't change much. Although I do not have the exact number when you remove, remove just the W mass that you were asking, but they would bet it's just slightly above this, but they can do it. Thank you. Thanks. Very good point. OK, we are ready for, I think, uh, the last question, since uh, Massimo has already answered a lot of them. The last, is one, uh, the last one is uh, from uh, Urs Wiedemann. Ah. Oh, Massimo. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> so I'm, I'm 
you made a, at the very end a curious remark when you commented on the theory efforts accompanying muon e. You said you were also looking at how muon e physics could be impacted by new physics. Yes. So assume for a moment that in G minus two, what Fermilab and and BNL have now is a new physics. Do you have an idea how it, I mean, would just would you just have a reference number? Can you exclude that it also shows up in muon E? Um, possibly it's partly also a question to Graziano Venanzoni. But... Yes, absolutely. We really studied exactly this because uh, after all, we are looking at uh, new physics, which could explain well, I mean, perhaps the G minus two with this kind of discrepancy. Then you think now I'm trying to extract the uh, delta alpha from a measurement at that level of precision. And then, well, the measurement is inclusive. We'll ob obviously measure everything, everything except what I subtract. And what I subtract is QED and the electrical contribution. So I'll draw. Well, it's adronic plus new physics, of course, if new physics is there. So what we did actually with, um, there have been two analyses of this, one with Pai de Paris and Antonio Mazier and another one by this group here in Heidelberg. So what, <clears throat> what we did is uh, the, the experiment runs at, as you know very well, it runs at roughly one G. That's a scale that we have in mind. So we can think of heavy new physics and light new physics. Heavy new physics, the analysis can be done with an EFT formalism. And then what we did is really trying to look at possible, all the possible operators that could, comp could contribute. And there we really could ex exclude the pollution, let's call it like that, or the contamination by new physics, because we would have seen it already somewhere else. And there are many, I mean, the analysis is quite detailed actually to, to come to this conclusion, but one of the strongest constraints and more diff most difficult were really from vector or axial contributions because the scalar or tensor are very small and suppressed by the electron mass, the pseudo scale doesn't interfere, but vector and axial are actually quite important. And because of course it's like the photon. I mean, so first of all, you think of a dark photon, how, which contribution will it give? And actually you can actually exclude it. By, by the fact that you would have already seen it in E plus E minus scatterings uh, in, uh, in E plus E minus into mu plus mu minus, which is just the reverse channel in either total cross section. These are the channels that we mainly use for the vector constraints or the asymmetries. And this is what we mainly used for the axial vector constraints. So if the energy is, if the scale is high, the analysis was uh, really very strong. And the results were not obvious at all because of what you are asking. I mean, we could not in principle say that we could exclude this contribution at 10 to the minus five, but by this correlation, we can say, yes, it cannot pollute it. For light new physics is a bit more difficult because then you have to start thinking, well, spin zeros, the one mediators, and you have to start taking models. Here, one thing that helps a lot is the fact that uh, we will have a measurement of the shape of the adronic cross section. So you need contribution that she really should tilt your contribution rather than just giving an absolute contribution. For example, the dark photon would change the, the tilt and therefore it's not sensitive at all to, to that. And even there, however, by choosing several examples and correlation, we managed to exclude also spin zero. So as I said, the out axon like particles or, or dark Z, I mean, spin, spin one contribution and even lepton flavor violating exclusion by using the muonium oscillation. This was actually very powerful constraint to change the new plus E minus into E plus mu minus oscillations. So actually this analysis and similarly, the analysis of the, Heisen, uh, the Heidelberg group came to the very same conclusion. We are very unlikely uh, it's very unlikely that we will have a, a contamination from, from new physics in thank the extraction you. of delta. Thank you, and thank you very much again for your talk. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, two comments in the chat. One comment from Alvaro saying that uh, he thanks you because you didn't uh, spend time discussing all the results that appear on the archive. Uh, with <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we... We feel that uh, we want to say- There were too many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then there is a question by Gian Piero, maybe Gian Piero Falsarino, I don't know, asking Probably. what is the standard model effective field theory telling you? Eh, this is a question that probably Paride can answer if Paride is connected because he just worked on that uh, very recently. Paride, are you around? Uh, yes, I am. 
because it, it did exactly that. I mean, so he probably wants to comment better. Than, he can comment better than answer better than me to John Pierre. Uh, well, as we know, if new physics lies, first of all, if new physics is there and if it lies above the electric scale, much above the electric scale, the question of solving the current anomaly through new physics can be approached indeed, as Jean Pierre is saying, through the standard model effective field theory approach. Well, there are few operators which can be at work. The most obvious one, of course, are the dimension six dipole operators, okay, which provide in the effective field theory framework a three level contribution to the, these dipoles. Actually, uh, there might be indeed the signatures even at high uh, energy colliders, which could probe the very same new physics effects, which is entering into the G minus two of the muon. No? Uh, another possibility, uh, which is a bit more, less obvious, is provided by the presence of semi-leptonic operators. Okay, so if you have the semi-leptonic operators. The, uh, you can close the quark loop, uh, effectively providing again uh, a dipole operators. And therefore also in this case, exploiting the fact that now the hierarchy flip uh, necessary to generate the dipole can be implemented through a quark uh, mass insertion, most uh, predominantly a top quark mass, for instance, you can get, in spite of the loop suppression, a very large contribution also from these loop induced semi-leptonic operators. So I would claim that the most likely effects uh, which provide, uh, which can provide an explanation for the G minus two anomaly, which we observed so far through this effective approach arise from uh, dimension six dipole operators and dimension six semi-leptonic operators. Uh, so. I don't know whether there were other points that you had in mind. Okay, it seems uh, that the questions uh, are over. So <laughs> I can free you. <laughs> Not yet. No. <laughs> Not yet. I have an important comment on slide 34. Yes. <laughs> There's something wrong. Oh, yes. Uh, ah. what's, what's wrong there? You are all men. You, oh, have, to, ah. you have to hire some. That's two. Okay. That's two. But uh, in fact, uh, there are several uh, students now, uh, Great. female students that joined the, the, the group. So <laughs> we are improving slowly. Good. But very improving. good. Very good. So now I'm happy. <laughs> Now, okay. uh, really thank, I want to really thank Massimo. He asked all the questions and he, the, the, the seminar was great. And I, want, I want also to mention that there is a Q&A uh, um, form that you can fill if you have more questions on our webpage. Please Massimo, send us your slides. Sure. And that's all, really thanks. Thank, to all thank you. Thank, thank you, Master. Stefania. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you to all the organizers. Thanks a lot. Have a Thanks nice a evening and see you next Wednesday. Bye. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. 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 Grazie.